Good morning, church family. Welcome to 180 at Home. We are so glad that you joined us. We're going to open in prayer and then lift up the name of Jesus together. Father, thank you for this incredible day. Thank you just for the ability to reach out into homes and into offices and to lift up Jesus together, even if it's online. God, I ask that you would use every person that's in this building right now to lift up your name, to experience the presence of God, and help us to have a great day. In Jesus' name, amen. Go wherever you're at this morning, just sing along with us, worship the Lord today.
worship. Begin to sing a song of thanksgiving to the Lord for his faithfulness, for his goodness. His word says that he'll never believe us and he'll never forsake us. God, we're taking you at your promise this morning.
So thankful for this opportunity, Jesus, to sing about your name. Lord, and I ask as we go throughout this week that you can let your praise fill this temple, Father God. Lord, the temple of our minds, the temple of our hearts, fill us up, Jesus. And we worship you, God. Good morning and welcome to 180 at Home. We love and miss you all very much. Just a few announcements and reminders for this week. Our youth get together on Wednesdays at seven o'clock through Zoom. If you're a middle schooler or high schooler, or if you have a child that is in that age group and you want them to be a part, please reach out to Parker and Jennifer Householder. They would be happy to get you involved in that. And also on Wednesday nights at 7.30 is our Zoom meeting for the study of Undercover that Pastor Brad is doing. If you have not been a part of that and you want to know how, please email Pastor Brad and he'll give you those instructions on how to do that. Also, we want to remind you, um, or I guess announce, that on June 1st, our young adults are going to start meeting again at 6.30. If you would like to be a part of that, please let myself or Ryan Bumbleo, my husband, know. We would love to have you be a part. And this is something that we share with you every Sunday, but it's because we really want you all to reach out about this. We have food boxes that we can give out if people are in need, whether it's you, a coworker, a neighbor, a family member. If someone could benefit by a box of food, please reach out to us so that we can get that to you um, or the person that you know. As we move on to our giving this morning, I wanna remind you that there's three different ways that you can give. There's online giving at rio180.com. You can also mail your giving in to 1104 Montvale Station Road, Maryville, Tennessee, 37803. Or you can also do text to give. So text the word give to the number 865-383-8773. And you'll get a response back that has instructions on what to do from there. Before we pray, I wanna share with you all a verse. In 1 Corinthians, it's 13, 13. And now these three remain faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. I hope you all know that you're missed dearly and that you are loved very much. And if you're struggling in this time or you just need someone to talk to, we would love for you to reach out. We miss you all very, very much. Let's pray this morning. Lord, we thank you for another morning to come together in our homes or in our cars or at work and to worship you and to be a part of a different type of worship experience ask for your protection over all of our families and our friends this morning. And Lord, I ask that you would continue to guide us, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. I love you guys. Good morning, church family. Thanks again for, for joining us. Thank you, Kelsey, and our awesome worship team. And I just want to talk to you for a moment before we get into God's Word um, and tell you that I do not enjoy this any more now than I did a few weeks ago when I told you I hated this. Um, this has been a pretty trying um, week for a lot of people. From the end of last week's message um, till the time we recorded this uh, service, I've received somewhere three or, or four um, messages from people and it started almost immediately after last week's service and and the the questions the comments the the idea was i'm tired and i'm frustrated about how things are going and 
I'm not sure God is still paying attention, and I don't know where He is, and I don't know if He knows what's going on in my life. And, and I'm, I'm just, as I'm hearing that and, and thinking about the, the message that, I, that I'm going to preach this morning, uh, for one, they, they fit very well, um, but two, it doesn't change the fact that it's really hard. And, and so I just I wanted to encourage you, before we recorded our, our worship part this morning, I sat down with our, or, or stood there with our, our worship team and talked about we're at that point, and we've probably been at that point a couple of weeks, but I do believe that people of faith are, are, are handling it a little bit better. Um, and, but we've gotten to that point where people are just tired, and they don't want to deal with it anymore. And it's not just the conspiracy theorists that think this is all fake, and it's not just the people that think it's going to kill everybody. It's kind of everybody from either end of the spectrum all the way to the middle where I am, um, and a lot of you are. It's just I'm tired of this, and I'm ready for things to go back. I'm, I'm ready for normalcy. Um, and so what do we do when these things begin to happen and it doesn't feel like we can see the end inside? I mean, we've have, we have our, our June 7th, uh, service ready, and I know a lot of you are looking forward to it, and we're looking forward to it, uh, but in the meantime, and even after that, what do, what do we do, and how do we handle this? And so I want to share a message with you today. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and then I want to share a message with you today that may be closer to my heart than I, I want to share, uh, but I feel necessary to, to share this with you. So if you would, just bow your heads and and, uh, and, and let's just ask God to speak to us today. Father, we thank you for this great day, and, and we thank you for a beautiful morning. And, and we ask that you would speak to your people today. God, I ask that you would speak through me. Um, my, my prayer is that you would use me today, that you would hide me behind your word, behind your anointing, behind your purpose, and that you would touch lives through your word and, and the words that I believe that you've given me. And God, I ask as, as we go through this that, that we wouldn't get to the point where we just push back and say, that's not for me, because I know that your word is true. I know that Philippians 1.6 says that, that you will carry to completion whatever it is that you've started. And for every person that is sitting and watching this this morning, or maybe they're watching this this evening, uh, or maybe they're watching this sometime later in the week, for every one of those people, I believe that just because they're watching this, that you've started something inside of them. And I believe and pray that you would carry that to completion. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to read you a scripture, and you've heard me say this a lot, um, if you've been around our church or if you've been around me. Uh, but then I want to tell you why this means so much to me and my family. Um, and this is kind of a, um, if, if our family had a theme verse, this would be that verse. Um, and again, you've heard me quote it, you've heard Kelsey quote it, um, but Daniel 3.18 says, But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. The first three words in this scripture, but if not. So how do we get to a place and what does this even mean for us? And, and I want to share something with you. If, if you, again, if you've been coming to our church very long or you know my family, um, you know this story very well, but there's a lot of people that have just uh, begun watching online over the last few uh, weeks, and, and I, I want to share this and, and maybe remind us, I had to remind myself this week, uh, but maybe remind us what this means. In, in 1995, um, it was around April of 95, our four-year-old daughter uh, was having a lot of trouble with her kidneys. And we had been to the doctor back and forth, and she had several urinary tract infections and couldn't figure out why our four-year-old was thirsty all the time and couldn't figure out why she, she wet the bed at night, and, and it was embarrassing for her even as a four-year-old. Um, and so we took her to the doctor, and the doctor um, told us that we had to take her immediately to Children's Hospital, that she had diabetes. And... Just to clarify the difference in what Kelsey has, and, and now Jordan, um, the diabetes that they have is not curable. This is not something that they change their diet and they can come off of insulin. They, they have to, to take shots every day. They have to prick their finger four to five times a day at a minimum. Um, and this is how they survive and this is how they live. 
and this happened to our four-year-old. And, and part of the story is the first day there in the emergency room, uh, they gave her a shot of insulin because her blood sugar was over 600 and it took like four or five nurses um, and technicians to, to hold her down, this little bitty child, um, and give her her first insulin shot. And again, those of you that have been around me, you've heard this many times. The doctor walked out of that emergency room, um, patient room, and took Tammy and I to the side. And both of us are just incredibly distraught um, at our child. And those of you that have children that have ever had to take them to the doctor for a shot or had even more serious trauma and situations, you understand you know, we were upset, we were crying, and the doctor looked at us and said, you're going to have to do that three to four times a day for the rest of her life. And we were, we were devastated, and, and the next few days were even more devastating as we had to stay in the hospital and learn how to handle this. Um, but that's not what this story I wanted to share with you. It wasn't but a few months later that we were sitting in the living room, and I still remember, it was, it, now it's such a traumatic thing, we were sitting in the living room, and I remember Kelsey climbing up on my lap. By this time, she's about five years old. Um, she climbs up on my lap, and she asked me the question that no father ever wants to hear if your child has a disease. She asked the question, why? Why do I have to do this? And I sat there as this strong man of God, Father. And I came up with the dumbest answer that even today I'm embarrassed by. And I told her, here's, here's, here was my answer. You talk about an answer that was played out in, in prayer and, and full of faith. And um, <clears throat> I, I, She's sitting on my lap. She's about this big, seemingly at five years old. And I said, well, honey, you know, a lot of people get this disease. Um, and, and God just thought that you were so strong and so special that he could trust you with it. <laughs> wow. Talk about make God look good and, and talk about, you know, just... Uh, just making yourself a, a great parent. I got, I got Parent of the Year Award that year for that statement. Um, pretty, pretty sure I, I got the trophy for that. Um, and I left it, and, and at five years old, she took it and thought that was the greatest answer she'd ever heard. And uh, it was the following year that a friend of mine shared a story with me. And he, he told me, he said, Brad... He said he, he had two children that was diagnosed with cancer. And he shared this scripture with me, this fascinating scripture in, in Daniel chapter 3, verse 18. And he began to emphasize the but if not. And so I went back to my daughter and I said, sweetheart, I, I need to tell you something. And, and I told her, I, I shared this verse with her. And I said, I want you to know that this is how we're going to live. We're making a decision as a family today. And it was in the spring of, of probably 96. It was later. Um, it was a little bit after April, March, uh, somewhere later. And uh, I said, we, we're making a decision as a family that we're going to live by this scripture. And the scripture is, but if not, King, we are not going to bow down to your image, and we are not going to give in to this because our God is able. And before I tell you the rest of that story, most of you know it, but before I tell you the, the rest of that story, I need to tell you what we had to go through as a family and the questions that we had to answer as a family before we could get to that point. And, and in your notes, there's three questions there that I have, and, and, and under the title, Ask Yourself, and I believe these are three questions that you have to learn to say yes to if you can live by the, the, the idea, but if not, we're still going to serve the Lord. And, and here are the three questions. The first one is, do I trust God? And it, it's bigger than just 
the, the, the typical statement that Christians and, and followers of Christ make about, I trust God. I, I mean, do you really trust God? Or are you to the point that you, no matter what happens, you trust the integrity of God, you trust the love of God, you trust the Word of Do you trust God? And, and, and if you can answer yes to that, then I believe you're on your way to, to this, this idea of living for God with the, with the attitude of, but if not, we're still not going to follow the king. We're still going to follow the, the Lord. The second question is, does he, does God love me unconditionally? You have to wrestle with these questions. I, I, I'm, I'm really, I, I don't know how to say this, and I hate that I'm saying it, through your screen today. I wish you were sitting here in front of me, but, but I, I really want you to understand and grasp the gravity of these questions of do I trust God? Do I believe that He loves me unconditionally? Because if here, here's what I would say. As a parent, I've always wanted my children to know that I love them no matter what. I want them to always know that I'm on their side and I'm for them. And even when times are hard and even when it seems like dad's just a little bit rough around the edges and it seems a little impatient today, I still want them to know that no matter what they feel at the moment, that they can trust me and that I love them unconditionally. And, and again, do we, do we have the faith to say yes to that question? And then the third question is, and, and, and this is where a lot of people, we, we begin to, to, to go in different paths, but I believe that if you're truly going to live a life of, but if not, I believe you have to answer this last question, yes, also. And this last question is, am I willing to serve Him? Am I willing to serve Him? Am I willing to serve God? Not, are you willing to, to look good on social media and post scriptures? Not, are you the one that you always check in online and, and when we have church in, in the building, you're always the one that's there. I'm, I'm talking about, are you willing to serve? Are you willing to sacrifice to serve Jesus? Because here's the thing I want you to know about this scripture, but if not, a lot of you know that the three Hebrew children... Um, the, the story in Daniel chapter 1 and 2, and then it gets into verse 3. The three Hebrew children were slaves, and, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego what, it wasn't even their name. That was the slave name that they were given them, that, 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 they, that they were given. And during this time, um, they were found to be in such favor with the king that he gave them positions of power, positions of honor. And people were jealous, and they didn't like it. They didn't like the fact that a slave... Was, was raised up to this position. And so when the king got so full of himself, and you read the story for yourself, <clears throat> the king got so full of himself that he told, he, he, he had an altar, basically an image built, and he said, when you hear the band play, go read it for yourself, I'm not going to say all those things, uh, but when you hear the band play, I want everybody in the country to bow down to my image. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego realized that that was against what their God had told them to do. And so they refused, and so they got in trouble. And so the king brought them in, and, and if you see, if you think about this and see it, the king brings them in, and he brings them, I, I can imagine he brought them into his, <coughs> excuse me, his court to begin with. And in his court, he just simply said, hey, I've heard, this is my version, okay? If you're following along in your Bibles, you're not going to find all this. But my version, and, and the way I see it, is he tells them, guys, you know, I put you in this position. I've been really good to you. You owe me something. And so when the, man, when the band plays, I need you all to bow down. I don't even care if you mean it. I just want you to bow down. And they said, no, we're not going to. And so this made him angry. And he got ticked. And, and so he, I, I imagine they move the meeting outside next to this furnace. And, and he tells them, he says, okay, listen, I'm giving you one more chance. Are you going to bow down when the, when the band plays? And the band played, and they didn't. And so in verse number 16 in, in Daniel chapter 3, it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able 
to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. And then verse 18 comes right back, and they say, but if not, it's not going to change anything. If he doesn't heal us, if he doesn't deliver us, if he doesn't do everything that I believe he's promised me, here's what they were saying. We're just going to die. And we will die knowing that our God was able. So here is your uplifting message for whatever day today is of May. It's the 17th of May, 2020. Welcome to 180 at Home. For all of you that were expecting me to say, if you will just do this, you will be healed, you will be delivered, you will be rich, you will get jobs, you will get promotions, you will find that person of your dreams, all of those things. I'm standing here telling you, none of that, none of that may happen. But, but preacher, I've heard that if I will just have enough faith, I can't tell you how many people I wanted to punch straight in the mouth when our children were growing up. Because what I didn't share in the first part is that in 2002, around July of 2002, seven years later, our son was diagnosed with the exact same disease. And if you don't think that my children and my family and my friends and my church believed that God could heal them and prayed and they had so much oil rubbed on their heads, they had acne from so much oil being pushed on their heads as young children with people believing that they would be healed. And I'm not making fun of any of those people. But I'm telling you that we lived the very best we could We trusted God as much as we could. And it wasn't until a friend of mine came to me and said, you need to read this verse. And by the way, that friend of mine who's still a friend today that I love, one of his children died of the cancer. And he came to me and told me, but if not, we will not bow down. And so for for everybody that says that we just need to have enough faith and we didn't have enough faith and we still don't have enough faith and that's why we're not healed, I want to share a story with you. It's in the New Testament. It's in John chapter 5. I'm just going to read through it. And then we'll talk about it just for a minute before we close. John chapter 5, verse number 1. This is the New Testament. This is is Jesus. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there, was, now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. It's, it's five covered porches. And here a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. Verse 5, One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Verse 7, Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. And and, and real quickly, the the tradition or the belief or the old wives' tale, whatever you want to call it, the belief of the time, which is actually in chapter 4, I mean in verse 4, but what they realized in the manuscripts as they studied those and learned more about the manuscripts is that verse number 4 probably wasn't written by the original author. It was simply put in there by a translator who wanted everybody to know why they were at the pool. And the, the, the tradition, if you will, belief at the time, is that at some point during the day or whatever, an angel would come down and stir the water up, and the first person in the water got healed. And and so the man tells Jesus, when Jesus walks up, he doesn't know who Jesus is. And Jesus walks up and says, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be well? Verse 7, sir, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water's stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone beats me. Someone else goes down ahead of me. 
Verse 8. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat and go. Pick up your mat and walk. And in verse 9, at once the man was cured, was healed. And he picked up his mat and he walked. And the day on which this took place was the Sabbath. So now, my question to you. How much faith did this man have? <laughs> I'll answer it for you. Zero. Not only did he not have any faith, he didn't even know who Jesus was. He was depending on tradition to heal him. He was depending on, on, on a set of rules and a, and a list of things he had to do. I have to be first in the water. I can't get in the water until it is stirred. And if the water is stirred and I'm first in the water, then I'll be healed. And if I can't get in first, I'm not ever going to have my healing. And Jesus, and here's something else I want you to think about. Jesus walks through multitude. Let me, let me go back and read it. You don't have to put it on the screen. But it said, verse 3, here a great number, a great number of disabled people. There were so many people here. I imagine Jesus, as he walks through, I imagine him kind of stepping over, excuse me, pardon me, trying to get in. What brought him to this man? I have no idea. There's no explanation given in Scripture. And so here's what I, I, I want to share with you before we close. And I want you to really think about this. These are my truths. That, that's what I, I put in the, in the outline. My list of truths. And, and here's why I say it's my list of truths. But because these are not just something that I made up. These are not just things that, that I decided this is the Word of God. There, there was a, a, a meme that was shared with me last week, and, and I've quoted it about 14 times in the last seven days. And it goes something like this. It says, I can do all things through one verse taken out of context. And, and so what, what I have done is, is as I've put this, this list together for you that I want you to write down, what I've done is, is kind of shared with you what my thoughts are when we talk about healing and when we talk about um, a deliverance and when we talk about God coming through for you here are my truths according to scripture specifically this scripture the first one is this not everyone got rescued think about that not everyone gets rescued now I don't know what how you feel about that. I don't know what you think about that. But I know that the, the Word of God says here in this story, not everybody got rescued. Now, I know there are times when Jesus would go into a city and He just healed everybody. And I don't know what that would have been like. I, I, don't know if, you know, I don't know if it was an Oprah moment, you get healed, you get healed. I don't know what it looked like, but there were times when Jesus went, He would preach, He would share, and then everybody got healed. But I read this story that's still in the Word of God, and it's in every Bible that I've looked at, and it said that Jesus walked into a multitude of people who were sick and hurting, and He only healed one. So what do we do with that? Is it a lottery? If you begin to focus on the only thing that matters is your healing and your answered prayer in your situation, you've missed the entire scope of what God wants to do in the world. And so the first thing you've got to come to grips with is that not everybody got rescued. It just doesn't go any better. The next one, number two. Tradition wasn't working. Tradition wasn't working for this guy. I gotta be honest with you. There's a there's an instigator inside of me that I fight all the time. No, no, that's not true. I fight most of the time. Before the, the pandemic and I remember hearing pastors that would talk about technology and really, really, really say bad things about technology. And, and I, I've, I've shared with a lot of my friends about 
how hard we've worked even before the pandemic to try to get our online stuff, you know, even better and how important I thought it was because there are people that just don't come to church that we can reach. And there have been so many people that have said, um, said, well, if they're not going to come to church, I don't know that you can reach them. And here we are. Here we are. I don't know, Jacob, the, the highest number of people or highest number of devices that have logged in and watched our YouTube stuff is around 500 or, or more, They're pretty close. So around 500 devices. And so the most we've ever had in here that's not been an Easter has probably been about 340 people and more than double, if not triple that, have, have paid attention and watched online. Sometimes tradition doesn't work. And that's hard for a lot of us, especially the older I get. The older I get, the worse that is to say, because there's some things I just kind of like the way it feels. I like the way the flow of the service. I like the way the seats are. I like the way... But tradition doesn't always work. And when tradition doesn't work, what do we do? And when not everybody's getting healed, what do we do? So the last thing I want you to write down, I don't think I've been too long. Number three. The only answer was the power of Jesus. The power of Jesus was the only answer. The power of Jesus is the answer. But that doesn't change the fact that there were still multitudes minus one that did not get healed, that did not get that answer. And so before we, we play this last song, I have to tell you that, but if not can be your rescue moment. Answering those first three questions. Do I trust God? Do I believe that He loves me unconditionally? Do, do I? Do I? Do I? Am I willing to serve Him? Do I believe these things? Am I willing to serve Him? And the last thing, I just, I just want to share this with you. I want to ask you this question as they get ready to sing. And this is the question. What is your but if not moment? As serious as I can be before they play this song, what is your but if not moment? And I'm going to rattle through just a couple before I get out of the way. Is it healing? Is it healing? Have you gotten the diagnosis that you just did not want to hear again? Have you gotten the diagnosis that you've been afraid of for most of your life? And you're believing and you're paying your tithe and, and you're coming to church on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, turning on the TV, and you don't kick puppies. You're a good person. You're a nice person. And you've still got that sickness or disease. Your healing can come from, but if not. Are you hurting financially? And there's no explanation. Like, you're, you're not a bad steward of what God has given you, but, but the, the pandemic has wiped you out. And you're a dad and a husband. And if you're like me, you're looking every day, I got to take care of my family, I got to take care of my family, I got to take care of my family. And I've been very fortunate through this. But I know some people are hurting. And you wonder what's wrong with you. And I'm sitting here telling you today, there's nothing wrong with you. I don't know how this works. Or maybe this, this time has done something and, and you wonder about whether your family is going to stay together and what will people think I don't know but I'm asking you to believe I'm asking you to believe that God is able and whether he chooses you for healing or restoration or whatever financial blessing looks like, whether He chooses you or not, that you will boldly stand 
in front of whatever cliff you feel like you're about to fall off of. Say, God, I know you're able, but if not, I still believe. As they sing this song, I just ask you this morning, what is your moment? What is your situation?
promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my But if not, I want you to ask yourself, what is my but if not moment, situation, what is it? Isaiah 55 verse 8 says that God's ways are higher than our ways and His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And so if I can encourage you in any way, I know it's difficult to, to reconcile everything with what you've experienced and what you believe the Word of God is true. The Word of God is true and you can trust it. And, and don't worry about what anybody else says about it. Don't worry about what anybody else posts about it. The Word of God is true. Get in God's Word. My encouragement to you, read Isaiah 55 this week and see if God doesn't speak to you. Thank you for joining us this week. 180 at home, 180 in your office or in your car, we want to be a blessing to you and we want you to know that God is on your side and He's for you. I hope you have a fantastic week. God bless.